we are recording. All right. Now, I'm not recording you. The screen is being recorded. Okay. Um, if we have class discussions, I may try to figure out some of the way to do the chat box here and have this. Um, and so the audio is going to be on the screen for us to have on the screen as I do today. Um, if you miss a class, heaven forbid, if you get COVID or if you get exposed to COVID and have to go in quarantine for a couple weeks or whatever, uh, you will have access to all of the class material, everything we cover. So, you know, no, no fear there. Um, that's not a substitute for coming to class and participating. Participation is a condition of our uniform class. So just a couple of logistical points. The best way to reach me is email, um, but you can also send a message on Canvas, which comes directly from the link that's in the chat box. So any questions about how to reach me or anything else? All right, so let's talk about this class. I'm going to volunteer to read this first paragraph in the course description. Uh, I'll remember to mute Shiloh. Why don't you? A mouthful. Thank you for reading. Um, I want to unpack this a little bit. First and arguably most important thing is the term liberal education. What does liberal education mean? All encompassing? Possible definition you give it, but you can give it so many facets and ways of looking at it. Any other responses? You might think, well, politically it's uh, not conservative, right? Uh, it's a large government, and uh, uh, but that's not the that's not the sense of this work, right? Liberal and and Asian education is a Using that term. Have you heard the term liberal used outside of the political context? Which is not with reference to politics. I mean, you said all encompassing. Do you want to add anything to that? I really like what you said. So much of that is kind of unknown. Any other responses to the word liberal? Yes. Okay. I was wondering if somebody would pick up on that, right? Meaning what? Often or freely, as much as you want. And that actually is, I mean, if you go back to comes from Latin, and it specifically is from the adjective for free. Okay. Um, a liberal education in its original formulation in the ancient world, and this comes from the Greco-Roman context, Greeks and Romans, they call it. Think of education in terms. So the, the way they 
targets that may come back different on the occasion. Well, let's start with them. All right. uh, there were venerable educational institutions in the ancient world. Among them, uh, there was one in, in Athens called the Academy. Um, that was begun by a guy you may have heard of. Plato, the famous philosopher, began his school and offered an education to those who could afford to pay it. Okay. Um, and there was a sort of model that went forward. Aristotle, his student, who started a school called the Lyceum, who did similar things. Um, the Romans, when they kind of took over the Mediterranean, they tended to hire Greek tutors for their children. The Greeks, even though the Romans had, had kind of conquered them, the Greeks had a reputation for good education. Right? The Romans hired these tutors, um, at least those who could afford them, and the Romans thus received a Greek-style liberal education. From this tradition of education, in late antiquity, and these time periods need not concern us over much, suffice it to say this is like 4th, 5th, 6th century, okay? This tradition culminated in this program. I have terrible handwriting. I'm going to have to get used to this. Um, I write like a third grader. Here we go. Maybe that's the name of the tradition. Uh, the Artes Liberales. Artes Liberales were a set of, you might call them skills, okay, uh, focuses of study, areas of study that uh, educated people um, would pursue and all through the Middle Ages. Um, this was the course of study in places like the monastery, later in the cathedral schools, the cathedral schools combined with other institutions in places like Paris and Bologna and and Oxford and Cambridge to form the first European universities in uh, about the 13th century. Okay. Um, and this was their course of study. Uh, as I said, it was modeled on things that came out of ancient Athens and later Rome. Um, the kind of education people would have received there. Um, of course, you know, being Christian, um, the people of the Middle Ages had a good religious emphasis to this. They tended to study these things um, with religion in mind, with career in the church in mind, and things like that, right? But it was still basically this classical curriculum. Okay. The Artes Liberales were broken down into seven things. Um, seven areas of study. And they further broke those down into two parts. There was, there was a group of three called the Trivium, and then there was a second a second group of four called the Quadrivium. Okay. Students started with the Trivium, and then later, once they had kind of mastered the Trivium or gained some proficiency in the Trivium, they would move on to study the Quadrivium. Uh, and if they got through all of that, that was essentially their undergraduate education, the equivalent of what you're seeking here at Bible College. Some of them stayed on to try to started with this. Okay. So what were the artes liberales? What were these seven things? Well, anybody know? Anybody want to try to say? Okay.
are delving into the whole black and gold. Um, this wasn't so much about specific texts and areas of study, but it was changed over time. Um, they used different texts to include different regionalities and Australian texts to include different regionalities, but each essentially the same. The first thing people study is what they call grammar. How do you like my new word? Well, what is grammar? What does that mean? No, the structure of a language. In other words, we have to learn the language. And this makes sense uh, in most of these historical contexts because you know, people didn't speak the language of education, right? The Romans, at least, uh, tended to be educated, if they had the opportunity to do so, in Greek. They spoke Latin, but their tutors would teach them in Greek, right? Educated Romans spoke and wrote in Greek. Um, even the, some of the most famous Roman authors, right, they originally composed their text in Greek. Virgil Later on, ironically, Latin was the street language, but it became the language of education in the Middle Ages. And so people who spoke French or Italian or German or English, uh, at least the medieval forms of these things, right, would learn Latin. So you've got to learn the language first. Well, let's just go with that, right? So start by learning the language. Grammar comes first. Then comes rhetoric. Um, and specifically, the way you use the language. Start by learning the basics, the structures of the language, okay? and then you learn how to use it effectively okay? to speak and write in a convincing fashion. We might say beautifully, perhaps. Now, once grammar and rhetoric had been studied, then the third part of the trivium, which was dialectic, as we would call it, or more simply, logic. What is logic? Well, to some extent, that's true. Okay, A lot of this is, is on the theoretical side. It isn't a very Okay. I mean, I think these things are very useful, but I think it's sort of sort of Well, it would absolutely because not only do they have to say things beautifully, they have to make sense. They have to make arguments or assertions that are logical, that are sound, that are. Essentially, that's where you begin with a modern college education. Right? Learning how to use and manipulate the language, how to make arguments, how to back them up with evidence. These are skills that you are going to use no matter what you decide to do. Right? Um, to give you one example, okay, my brother... Very successful business executive. He is a mayor of Boston. He uh, is a, a chief strategist for a Fortune 500 company. Um, he makes a ton of money. Okay. Uh, he lives a life that's very different than I than, than my life, right? I mean, I call him a professional salary executive. Uh, I'm not so sure I call him that. I just think he's a nice man. Okay. But my brother makes a I asked him a few years ago when we got together for some discussion on this. Um, so, Tony, what do you do at work? Okay. What do you 
He writes. Exactly right. He said, I write. Let's write back to this red line. No. That's exactly what I do. I mean, that's the, the central task of my job is to write. No matter what you do, you're going to have to write. And write well. And so learning the modern equivalents of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, basically taking part in this ancient form of education, is essential. Asking if the resource was going to be enough to fund a construction and be set aside for them within their circumstances. Now, you know, these are people mostly working in kind of minimum wage jobs or unemployed, uh, with these typical resources that they were being provided. One of the things I just found is that even in that case, writing is. Is still important. Again, it's just a great question. So this is an essential skill. Therefore, the modern American educational system um, is, is a very skilled one. Just to finish this up, the rest of the articles are about quad version. Once they figured out how to use their differential, they moved on to areas of study like arithmetic. Geometry. Those are different concepts. Uh, so complete mathematical systems. Those are different. Music, which is very important for church. And astronomy, mostly again with an eye toward understanding the mystery of God. It's not a coincidence, then, because of some things that happened later, that the American system was designed with this classical precedence at its bottom. Um, the 
founders of American higher education were, among others, founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin founded the University of Pennsylvania, and he himself was classically educated, as most educated people in the 18th century were. Right? They were still uh, tapping into this system that was by that point more than thousand years old. Okay. Still seeking the kind of education that um, you know that, that Cicero had sought or that Aristotle had sought. Okay. And so when Benjamin Franklin founded the University, University of Pennsylvania or Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, two of the big bastions of higher education in this country, um, they brought in this high degree. They brought the liberal arts. Um, now, they did make some changes, and, and these changes have uh, come down to us. They stopped, for instance, emphasizing Latin. They still taught Latin, but it wasn't the sum total of everything they were teaching. They encouraged people to learn the grammar, rhetoric, and logic for ancient kings that they had. Okay. Um, uh, but they introduced, no, no matter what students would go on to study, it was kind of their main emphasis, this whole system where students would have to seek a broad base of learning okay, in the liberal arts. This came eventually to be called general education. Now you may wonder, you may have been wondering, why you can't just go straight into your major if you really want to study straight into kids' classes about education or about mythology or about Christmas. Well, it's because of the American higher education system. Uh, they, they, there was an emphasis on the utility, the necessity of training these other kinds of pursuits, establishing a certain set of skills, especially the So that when you go on to study those more specific things, you will have that essential skill to be employed. Um, if you were to go to university in another country, this wouldn't necessarily be the case. The assumption would be that you would inoculate from, from a lower level of education. Uh, in fact, you would have to pass an exam to show that you could already write effectively and to, you know, to communicate at a level. Right? You would um, have mastered uh, up to a certain level mathematics and some of the other skills. Right? Um, and if you didn't score a certain level on such a test, you could not go to university. You would not be accepted. And students in places like the UK or Germany go straight into a major and that becomes their specialty. They have a four year college of education education program. But the American system harkens back to the earlier model. The University of Edinburgh. The idea that studying a program. truncating or shrinking down to some extent the, the major course of study um, is a, a necessary sacrifice to enable students to establish an essential skill. What do you think of that? You already could integrate the UK and the US and Australia and the US and Australia and the US and the US and the US
And it can be daunting. I went to grad school in the UK. I um, worked in the US for years. And then I taught in the German system and then subsequently I became a program leader in the German system and then taught in Germany. Um, and then I taught in Italy and Germany. And it can be really daunting to see what these undergraduate students already know how to do, right? I, I, my course of study um, when I was at Oxford included. Uh, we studied Hebrew, I think it's the last thing I mentioned, so I'm pretty much a Hebrew scholar. Right. And, uh, you know, as I was struggling through this, this year of Hebrew that I took there, I remember one time the, the Hebrew instructor um, uh, said to us, you know, if you were undergraduates here at Oxford and focusing only on Hebrew, uh, you would have done all of this in your first year and then you would move on. By the end of your undergraduate term, at the end of the four years, you would be reading complex rabbinical commentaries. And then I started in two or three books of rabbinical commentaries. Right? And I'm just thinking, I'm never going to make it. Right? So that can be really daunting. But on the other hand, I had a general education. I took courses in, among other things, uh, human physiology, um, geology. I took a really interesting course in geology, historical geology. Um, I took courses in. Um, uh, I think it's a really common thing. I took courses in economics. I took courses in anthropology. I took courses in philosophy. Um, I took math. Uh, I took general studies. And uh, you know, establishing connections between those various things, I think in some cases is now if you're still sort of wondering about all of this, there is a purpose beyond just you gotta know how to write. That is really important, but there's more. Right? And this course is designed with the more specifically in mind. Right? The word liberal, as we said, means Free. In the ancient world, there were very few free people. Truly free. Okay? There were a lot of slaves. There were a lot of people who, in one legal sense or another, were unfree. Beholden to somebody else. Uh, certainly, fully 50% of the adult population could easily be classified as unfree. Which 50% A certain hue of skin uh, may have been more likely to be considered free. Right? Uh, people of certain ethnic backgrounds or places of birth, right, depending on where they lived, uh, would have a more greater likelihood to be free. And certainly wealth, possession of, of certain worldly goods, uh, was necessary to be truly considered free. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this education, liberal education, was only for that select small percentage of the population who were free. And they were definitely privileged. The beautiful thing here is that, I mean, though, though inequality certainly persists, and we will spend a lot of time talking about that this semester, because one of the signs of these courses is to try to rectify some of the sort of ills. But you are all free. Okay. Freedom reigns, in fact. Okay. Um, you've heard the expression free country. Okay. You ask if you can do something, somebody says it's a free country. Yeah, that's a free country. Um, and then you say, sure. Okay. But we are not unique in that. Right? When I was growing up, I, was, I always thought, well, we're the freest country in the world. And I remember thinking about Canada when I was about seven years old. I'm like, well, Canadians, it's not free. Not America. It's 
support that in the U.S. Just, uh, the vast majority of countries in this world have freedom by any number of measurables. Uh, by certain measurables, the United States is actually lagging behind the rest of the world. So there's a, there are metrics out there that show you that. But suffice it to say, for our purposes at least, that we are free. Okay? Therefore, you can pursue the education that is designed for a free person. Right? And that is a wonderful privilege that you have, but arguably it comes with certain obligations. Let's talk about another term in this first paragraph. We have not made it past the first paragraph. No promises whether we will. Right? Citizen. What does it mean to be a citizen? Um, believe it or not, and this is something I have to correct students in history classes on frequently, um, rights, the whole idea of rights is pretty new. Okay. For most of human history, the truth is for most people were not free. Most people didn't even conceive of rights. In fact, the word rights itself uh, is relatively new and new. It emerges about the 14th or 15th century in certain writings. I don't want to get too much into the details about this, okay? Uh, but really sort of bursts into full flower in the 1700s. Okay. Um, when uh, John Locke and Jean-Jean Rousseau writes, okay? And so when Thomas Jefferson in 1776 borrowing lines from John Locke, which is not original to him, said that all people are endowed, he actually said all men, and he probably meant in the sense of males, uh, but we will go ahead with gender neutral for convenience, since he credited John Jefferson with having it out here. Uh, all people are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and and that became the founding document of this country. A country founded on the idea that everyone has rights by their very nature. Right? Just by being a human being, you have the right to life. You have the right to liberty. You have the right to pursue whatever you want to happiness. Okay. Right. Laws and things like that, right? One person thinks that happiness might be against the law. Sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it's still difficult to find. And that was remarkable. No, few people had ever conceived of people having rights, much less a whole society, a whole nation founded upon that very principle. But it was for political seizing upon the writings of Rousseau, you know, uh, had a revolution about a decade after the Americans did, um, and, uh, you know, this caught on to the British Empire in the Western world and later, uh, bludgeonly, in other places as well. All to the good of people who were free. But there's more than just rights. These are really important things. Okay. But citizenship also entails Contribute in some way. Okay. And 
and one of the ways that you make yourself able to contribute is just giving a gift. Black College is committed to this element of education. Listen to President Joyner for about 60 seconds and you're sure he knows. This is a valid this is one of the core values. Citizenship in a diverse society, recognizing the diversity of the community, emphasizing the class of the community. But this isn't just about you, it's about what you might do, how you might make the world a better place, how you might be a better person. So as we train ourselves with these necessary skills, we're also going to be thinking about our relationships. What do we have to do in the class? Like, just tell me, okay? I just want to know what I'm up to. Let's, let's treat this second paragraph more briefly. This high impact course will also develop students' capacity to forge cross-disciplinary connections, reflect critically on their own shared values and beliefs, and foster deep learning, providing an impetus for a strong ideal. Let me make that second. Some of them still exist, but it's not the same. The one term that, well, actually, quite different, quite different. Cross disciplinary. What does that mean? It's a key field of study. So, a discipline in the academic sense. Uh, this is related to that in, in a sense, but a discipline in an academic setting is a field of study. But it's more than just the content, right? You might assume that, for instance, the field of history, which is my field, okay, um, it's all about like learning who lived when and uh, what they did, the facts, right? But actually, there's far more important stuff to learn from history than that. It's an approach to learning thinking about how human beings behave, okay, and explaining why they do the things they do. Okay. So there are skills, there are methods to approach important questions that are part of the discipline of history. Learning those skills and methods makes you a more capable person. Right? And history is not alone. Every discipline has a set of skills and methods. Study economics, right? You learn to analyze things from a certain point of view in a certain way. You learn basic principles that you apply, like supply and demand and scarcity, okay? And, uh, and things and, and analyzing things at the margins, right? Uh, if you study um, psychology, okay, you learn basic skills and methods and approaches that allow you to interpret human behavior. Now imagine what might happen if you were to take the skills and methods of one discipline and merge them or join them together with the skills and methods of another discipline. Okay. Or maybe three or four of them all together. Okay. What's more powerful, Iron Man by himself or the Avengers? Well, obviously, if you join multiple superheroes together, assuming they can actually get along and not kill each other, sometimes, uh, they can do things that one of them alone cannot, right? And it's the same thing. You should think of discipline as free will. It's absolutely free will, right? They give you certain powers. If you can bring those together, you become more capable. Historians 
I have done everything that I could to learn as much as I could about things like economics and philosophy and theology and sociology and literary criticism and things like that because it makes me a more capable analyst of historical texts and human history. So this class is cross discipline. Um, it just says, you know, top taught by faculty from a range of disciplines. You got lucky and got a historian as your instructor. Historians are awesome. They're, they're really one step away from being super heroes. But, you know, this class would probably be nearly as, taught nearly as capably by a psychologist or by an anthropologist. Not quite, but close. I'm sort of doing what I do here. A lot of other Um, let's go on to the learning outcomes because I should have done the critical, uh, the word critical there, but I'll get to that. So, what do you what do you expect to learn in this class? Well, an understanding of the relationship between a liberal education and a meaningful citizen. I've already mentioned that. I'll spend a good bit of time on that. Here's a new close. That's close reading. You can do close reading of Harry Potter. I'm sure that many of you probably have. Um, it means reading to be involved with the text, to be changed by it, to want to know what it all means. That's close reading, and it's a close companion of interpretation. Writing, okay. writing both analytically and synthetically, and I'm not going to go into the adverbs and things like that. We can talk about that later. About essential historical, philosophical, and literary texts. This class was designed with exposing students to some key texts in their liberal education program. So what can we do? tells Ophelia, get thee to a nunnery. You might think, okay, he's telling her to go be a nun. Well, not necessarily. Right? There may be a hidden meaning there. Right? One, in the early 17th century, when this was written, nunnery could be colloquial for what? Anybody know? A brothel. He might be telling Ophelia, you're a whore, go where you belong. Because you slept with my children or whatever. Okay, I'm sure that's not the case. Okay, maybe. And there's a lot more going on besides that, right? So reading for more than just a superficial reading. Now, what are you thinking? Someone who cares? Like Shakespeare wrote this thing like 400 years ago. What does that mean for me? Well, there are skills that you can develop of trying to figure out what Hamlet's saying to his kids, or what he's really saying to his kids, that are affordable, that can be used in a wide 
in this world today, I, like what? What kind of critics are out there? Okay, everybody's a critic. I'll give you a choice. You, you turn on the television, what kind of critics might you hear? <laughs> Music critics. Soapbox moment. I'm not, I, earlier this morning, I, I noticed I've noticed I stood up on a uh, soapbox on a soapbox. Right? Please, please, please vote. Please. Okay? I've had many students over the years, including in Christian seminar classes, tell me when I was 20, 16, I had a conversation with students where they said, I just don't feel like I know enough to vote. Well, what the hell are you doing here then? Okay? You're a student. Learn about it. Learn enough to vote. Right? This is this is one of those obligations of citizenship. It is a right, certainly, but you shouldn't throw that away. Okay? This is important. You can probably hear me do that. Um, all part of the purpose of this But yeah, what is the job of a Judges it, and the result of the judgment is what? The word we use. They give an opinion. Thank you very much. That was really good. Sometimes you have to read my mind. Okay, I, I will try to ask more open-ended questions, but this is an important one. They give an opinion. If the critic is a good one, listening to, it must be backed up with solid analysis and evidence, explanations for why this opinion is valid. Okay. So at its heart, to think critically means to develop opinions and to present them in such a way that they are explained adequately and backed up with evidence. I could boil down the entire American educational system to that one sentence. Learning how to think critically, which means to develop opinions about things and to present them in a convincing fashion that they can get a good understanding. If you learn nothing else in college and you learn how to do that, you will be set. Take advantage of any number of opportunities if you learn how to think critically. That's why this class is important. And other classes as well. And this is a great class. In addition, so that's all this stuff going on, right? Um, students will develop key skills essential for college success. 
Um, I was worried about this because I've got the academic part, right? I mean, I, I feel like I can teach Hamlet and Socrates and these other things pretty well. And, uh, because I'm a historian, I've got a narrative in this class. I try to make it into a story. It should be a story I find very compelling. Hopefully you will too. But, you know, I, I know that you are going to a period of interruption. And so I will spend time in class and I have prepared assignments designed to help you um, be more effective college students. Okay. Things that I learned as a college student, um, I actually consulted with my daughter, who was a college student uh, my senior year at UVA, and she said, um, uh, said, you know, what, what are the essential skills you need at a college student level that you can discuss with other college students? You helped me to formulate some of these assignments. So um, that's something critical analysis skills and all that kind of stuff. Okay, any questions about the expected outcomes here? And I hate to get out of you, you gotta pull your mask up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. I, I don't want to be a hard ass on this. I really just yeah, I feel like I stop Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean I'm uncomfortable in this thing too. It's just like my nose is itching and you know it's not fun, but but here we are. Uh, these are the books you need to obtain for this class. Um, the, the best we can do is something you would give to try to just somehow get out of your way of not having to read this book. Um, we'll talk about those in class if you have them, but um, I wanted to get these scheduled ahead of time so that you could take them and try them. Uh, we, will, we will spend some time analyzing that and then talk about it and how it can help us. In addition to that, there is the, the Penguin edition of the last days of Socrates. We are only going to read two texts from that work, so the only available book. We will read Apology of the Pluto, which is the dialogue in Plato about the Seven Books. Uh, that's a pretty enjoyable book. Um, uh, we are going to read Hamlet, and specifically uh, the one that I'm using for class is the Older Shakespeare Library edition. It's Excellent edition has lots of good notes and explanations of words that might be confusing to you. We will read parts of, not the entire work, but parts of Timothy Ferris's Coming of Age in the Middle East. Um, because we want to talk about the implications of science on traditions of authority and religion and intellect and discourse and all that stuff in history. Acquaint us with the work of, among others, Galileo, Newton, Darwin, and Thomas Sowell. We will talk about them in the course of their discoveries for the story we're trying to tell in the class. Sigmund Freud's Civilization and Its Discontents. Um, not to learn to be Freudian psychologists, right? You can do that in your own time or in your own major or whatever, okay? But Freud. Um, wrote this at a really interesting moment in time. Again, there's a narrative to this class. This fits into that, and we'll try to grapple with some of the ideas that Freud has about why humans do what they do. Okay, we can choose to agree with him or disagree with him. Some of the opinion about, uh, about his ideas, right? Um, but hopefully we can be animated by that. Wouldn't for long. And then finally, Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, this is a new addition to this course, but because this is such an important and timely issue, uh, given recent events, okay, given events even of the last few days, anybody in Washington come out to like a concert or something like that, you know, that kind of thing. We need to to the historical narrative that we're going to be dealing with in this course, but we need to be able to support and defend these and uh, citizenship and all of this, right? And how, in a sense, our thinking about race represents a, a failure in this kind of direction. The 
title is provocative, but the title necessarily, well, you shouldn't just look at that title and make assumptions about what the book is about. Ibram Kendi is one of the leading public intellectuals in the time of the Second World War. Uh, he's currently a professor at Boston University. He was formerly at the Ripley Court. I have deal with this, and I don't mean deal as in like sweep it under the rug, I mean really confront the truth in ways that we haven't confronted in fact in society or even in the world. Um, you can choose to agree with what he says, you can choose to be angered by it, you can choose to reject what he says. The important thing is you have been exposed to it and, and thought critically about it, and maybe it ends up transforming you. That's the point of all of this. All of these texts that go through carefully with that goal in mind. In addition, there are other readings. Okay. Um, the syllabus has a daily schedule. For today, you were supposed to read the Dreams of Destiny and Duke. You all did that. Um, like I said, we will talk about this on Tuesday. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Uh, I want to talk about that. In addition, for Tuesday, you need to read three short articles. These Stern wrote to giving employers where they don't really want long, why we shouldn't think about college as a business. I don't know what the book's name is. Um, and then an article called Why Air Force Cadets Aren't Competitive in Boston. Okay. Now, this isn't in any of those books. Where would you find most of this? It's on Canvas. Okay. So if we look at the Canvas page, let's see some of it. Sorry, I should have pulled this up beforehand. So here's our course page. Um, the easiest place to get to almost all of the information you're going to need is the modules tab. Right? There's the syllabus. And here are all the course readings. You can see that those three are the first three there. Right. And all of these other readings that we're going to do this semester, you will find here. Most of these are quite short. So don't make it that long that you still need to take both of them. Um, we will do a lot of reading this book. We'll do a lot of writing about it. But these are definitely manageable. Okay. Um, so. In other words, read that before you come on Tuesday, not after. All right. The assignments for the class. Finally, what you've been waiting for. Four pages. No exams. Um, you have to write four pages. These are tied to units of the course. Um, I will introduce the narrative. should make sense why we write papers when we do this. These are summative in the sense that we have to think about everything we talk about. Up to that point, you can write this down and kind of get some conclusions about what it all means. Um, and I will give you prompts for these papers. I'll do part of the work for you. I will know the questions you have to answer. And in later courses in your college career, you're going to have to formulate your own questions. That's 200 out of your 300 possible points. You must take these papers in two weeks. Even missing one paper eliminates, what, 16.666% of your grade. You don't want to do that. That's a lot. So make sure that you're able to do it even if that means you have to skip one of these papers. But it's 16 points you have to miss. How many stories?
there will be times when I ask you to write in class. Sometimes at the very beginning of class to help your brain get going so that we can have a good discussion. Sometimes if you've you know, talked about a concept, you've really gotten into it, and I want to sort of pause and let you meditate on it, I'll have you write at that point. Okay? Take your time. There won't be a lot of these, but there will be some. And you need to be prepared to do it. Which means you need to come to class prepared. Right? You may walk in class and I say, uh, tell me what you think is going on in this scene in Hamlet. Well, if you haven't read the scene, you're screwed. Okay? There's no other way to put it. You know, you might as well walk out and take a zero at this point because you're not prepared. So you have to come to class prepared. Now, I don't apply a great deal of rigor to the grading of these. Um, they're either plus, check, minus, or zero. Okay? Um, if you miss that day, if you have done a student, then we will work through that and make it to the um, But, you know, if you turn in a blank paper and you, you know, fail on that nothing, you get a you know, minus or zero. Uh, if you do an adequate job and get a check, if you miss it by four, if you really engage with it, I'll give you a plus, and I'm pretty generous. Um, and so, you know, these are easy points if you're prepared. Okay. Now, this other one. A college skills scavenger hunt. Like I said, one of the purposes of this course is to acclimate you to college and try to get you prepared to be effective. Um, and so to aid with this, this is the part that my daughter helped me you know, come up with. I have at the end of the syllabus here a scavenger hunt. Okay. There are three parts to this, and these will be turned in at different, they're due at different Section A is due at the end of this, or the end of September, or not September. Um, section B is due at the beginning of November. Section C is the last week of September. So you have the fall semester to complete this. The first part of this is about becoming acclimated to the environment of Glasgow College, and these things are obviously in your mind. Okay. So these things, I hope, will be actually kind of fun, right? Make a list of two or three good study spots and explain briefly why these are here. This is really important. To find a place where you can work effectively. If you don't have that, you are at a severe disadvantage. When I started to take college seriously in my sophomore year, my freshman year was not an entire throwaway, but you know, do not do what I did. When I really got serious about it my sophomore year, one of the catalysts for that was I found a good place to study. It was the back of an auditorium on the campus. Um, it was an auditorium that was rarely used, only for like big concerts and things, so there was never anybody, there was never anybody in there like rehearsing or anything like that. And there was just a patch of carpet in there. It was fairly well lit. And uh, I would spread my books and papers and things out and, you know, sit on the floor. And I still remember some of the things I read in that place. Um, it was a great place. I've been on several of them. So that's an important thing, right? Visit some historically and culturally significant sites and you can, like, do uh, maintain proper social distancing and wear masks and do all these other things, right? But, you know, this is a, this is an age of golden city. Very close. You should take advantage of being there because it's a great place to have a community. Make a list of five local businesses you believe to be important. Right? It might be the best coffee shop in town. It might be uh, the place where you prefer to get your groceries. Right? Do you want to go to Publix or Aldi or Target or Walmart or you know, Winn Dixie or whatever? Uh, you know, which one? Bookstore. It can be, it can be the uh, Chick Fil A in your, you know, in your student center. It can be whatever. Right? So that's that's the easiest portion of this. The others involve a little more work. Okay. The second 
part of this is about using the library. about succeeding by tapping into the people who will help you succeed. So I ask you to meet with your advisor and to attend office hours of one of your current professors and to go to the Learning Resource Center and look at the guidance. Whether you think you need to or not, you need to. This will be helpful. So the assignment is designed to teach you that. To think about how you could do this more effectively take advantage of these opportunities. Any questions about that? Like I said, this is not due immediately, but you might want to get to work on this. And I will spend a little time in class periodically talking about all of these things. The skill of development. And then class for But I do offer rewards for good attendance and penalties for not so good attendance. Okay. I have a carrots and sticks approach to attendance. If you attend every day of the term, unexcused absence and jump down penalty, then I will automatically give you three points of extra credit. That's one percent of your grade for free just by coming to class. Okay. If you only miss once, you get one point. You, no penalty, but no reward. Beyond that, I start docking points for uh, some particular absence. Like one point per absence. So if you miss, you know, nine classes, you're going to miss seven points. That's a lot. Forfeited two and a half percent of your grade. And chances are, if you miss nine classes, you're not going to pass the class. Okay. So chronic absence. That said, we are recording this in podcast, so you will have access to all of this information. There's something about being in class and engaging with information and involved in discussion that you really can't replicate sitting in class and watching the class. So be prepared for that. That's what you have to do. Uh, the last point I want to make, um, since I haven't had really discussed this for a couple of minutes, is academic honesty. I think this is very, very important. Okay. Um, do not plagiarize, do not cheat. If you do, you will get caught. Professors are not going to forgive you. And you know how to get away with this. Okay. Everything that you turn in will be submitted to turnable.com via Canvas. But in addition to that, we have tools. We have our way. Please wipe down your desks. That's 